100 years. If you could have a chance to have dinner with any one or two people, mm. or three, who would you most want to have dinner with? Well, Churchill would certainly be the most fun. We were talking earlier about... Because he likes to drink and... The you, importance of alcohol right, in history. Right, okay. Imagine if you picked one of these great figures and they turned out to be like you, a teetotaler. Right. What a dull <laughs> dinner that would be. Uh, so I think, uh, always I think uh, pick iced the tea is very good too. And it, it, you know what? It does nothing for the quality of conversation. Okay. I just want to break a, a lance for alcohol because... Uh, I wrote a book called Civilization, which made the argument that there were six things that uh, set Western civilization on a trajectory that was exceptional. But there was a secret unwritten seventh chapter that I one day will write, which was alcohol. And because Western civilization it consumed alcohol in more elaborate and sophisticated ways than any other civilization, I think that mattered. And Churchill consumed almost okay. every variety of alcohol. And so what, a, what a fun dinner that would be. So, so you, would, would, be you would like to have one dinner with him. And, and if I had dinner with him, what would be one question you would like to ask him? Other than related to alcohol. But <laughs> I would ask him if he thought that there was a way he could have won the 1945 election. Remember, it's extraordinary that he leads Britain to victory and is immediately thrown out of office. And one argument is that he, he campaigned in the wrong way, quoting Hayek's Road to Serfdom, implying that Labour was going to establish some kind of authoritarian regime. I would love to ask him about that moment in his life, which must have been crushing. Cr a crushing rebuke after he'd achieved so much. And, and that, that would have been the question so, I now would have asked. The Churchill, there's a lot of great Churchill stories, speeches, and he'd give these very famous, um, uh, off the top of his head apparently, talks with great uh, wit and so forth. Was that planned? Did he rehearse those, as I've been told, or he really came up with these things off the top of his head? Well, I think Churchill was somebody who prepared, and Andrew shows that in his book. Right. I mean, there's a, an in, enormous effort that goes into developing Churchill's right. uh, speech-making style, and, and he modifies it in his career, right. becomes more, less aristocratic, more demotic. But he was a witty man, right. and, and there's no doubt that, that not everything was carefully worked out. Um, there's this wonderful story that I, I don't think is in Andrew's books, but I, I think of it every time I, I go to the loo. <laughs> every time. Because, especially here when there's a great kind of crowd and you're in a rush, and there's not always, you know, always really good time to wash your hands, let's be absolutely honest, right? <laughs> so the story about Churchill, which I love, is that he's in, it's wartime, and he's having a pee, and uh, there's a foreign office official uh, next to him, and uh, as they're leaving, the, uh, the foreign office mandarin just can't resist saying, Prime Minister, at Eton, we were taught to wash our hands after we peed. And Churchill replies, at Harrow, we were taught not to piss on our hands. <laughs> well, nobody, yeah, that's off the cuff. And I think of it every time well, I go to the I don't room. want to keep this in today, make this a, a, a joke relating to that only, but I'll give you another uh, Churchill joke like this. So Churchill's a member of the uh, majority party, uh, conservative party in uh, the parliament, and he goes out to the urinal, and um, he is um, standing in front of the urinal, and quickly uh, he sees Clement Attlee, the Labor Party leader coming in, and quickly zips up and walks away. And Attlee said, what's the matter? Are you embarrassed to stand next to the leader of the opposition party? He said, it's not that, but anytime you see something big, you want to nationalize it. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you one more Churchill story, then we'll get off Churchill. Yeah. So History Churchill, is much more fun than law. Right. That's so Churchill goes to Richmond, Virginia in his dotage years, and um, he is being led around by a dowager lady from uh, Richmond, Virginia, and she says, you know, can I help you get your food? And he says, well, okay. And she said, let's go to the line here to get the food. And she says, uh, what would you like? He says, I'll have some of that chicken breast. Oh, she said, in mixed company, we don't use the word breast. We use the word white meat. He said, okay, give me some of the white meat, fine. 
So he eats it and so forth. The next day, he leaves, sends her a corsage saying, thank you for a wonderful dinner. Please put this over your white meat. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, by the way, by the way, before I sell any more copies of Andrew Roberts's book, um, <laughs> one of the appeals of writing Henry Kissinger's life is that he too has a very mordant sense of humour. Uh, although sometimes that that's been used against him by his his critics, uh, because Henry Henry's sense of humour is almost of, of the Groucho Marx vintage. You sense that he picked it up having come to the United States in the mid-30s into the world of the Marx Brothers. And if you hear him say it, you get that it's a Marx Brothers type joke. A good example is at the beginning of a meeting to break the ice with some Turkish diplomats, uh, he says, uh, the illegal we do immediately, the unconstitutional takes longer. And it's obviously a joke, but the, the critics of Kissinger uh, ever since that document came out, have l repeatedly quoted it as if it was meant quite literally. And there are a great many jokes well. of the same variety. Um, the most famous thing I think he ever said was that you know, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. But when you see that in its context, it's obviously it's a, it's meant as a self-deprecating joke in answer to the question, why do you get to date with so many take right. out so many starlets on dates. So part of the fun of writing volume two is, is the Kissinger jokes, uh, which, I, you know, which I think I will be spending some time on trying to show that many of them were jokes. Well, see, he, uh, John Kennedy perfected self-deprecating humor because he was very um, secure, and so he could do, get away with it. Kissinger perfected self-deprecating humor, but which shows you how great he is. The power joke being right. one where you're yeah. basically saying, well, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac, and I have a lot of power. Yeah. So, right. Okay, so let's talk about Kissinger for a moment. Yeah. Uh, Kissinger was a Democrat, and he wanted to work in John Kennedy's administration. McGeorge Bundy didn't want to give him a job. So how did he manage to kind of do anything with Kennedy, and how did he actually um, take the rejection by McGeorge Bundy? Well, it's not quite true to say that he was a Democrat. He was one of the very few Harvard professors who uh, at that time didn't mind being seen as a conservative. Arthur Schlesinger, his friend, the historian, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., and he uh, would have political arguments in the 50s in the Harvard faculty. So it was well known that Kissinger was, was a conservative, if not necessarily a registered Republican. And in fact, I think he'd already become involved with Nelson Rockefeller even before then. But like most Harvard professors uh, then and ever since, uh, he was not content with merely lecturing uh, students and wanted to spend at least t some time in the corridors of power. So the opportunity arose when uh, John F. Kennedy was elected because Kennedy uh, intended to bring as many Harvard professors to Washington as possible. I mean, he more or less, having won the election, went to Cambridge with a bus and said, all aboard. <laughs> uh, it, it was remarkable. I don't know who did the teaching in 1961, because the place must have been empty. Uh, and one of the people who got on the bus was uh, the, the young Henry Kissinger. Uh, and he made a fatal mistake, which maybe Matt Bundy led him into, which was to be part-time. Now, nothing in Washington works on that basis. You are either all in or not in. So being a part-time advisor to the National Security Council ensured that Kissinger had minimal access, especially to Kennedy, but minimal access to any of the key decision makers. So he had this very, very frustrating experience, and it took him a while to realize that Bundy, whom he thought was a friend, uh, was in fact quietly marginalizing him, not least because Kissinger <coughs> knew too much about the big issue, which was Berlin. Even before the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was the huge Berlin crisis. And Kissinger actually knew about Berlin, and he'd grown up in Germany. So he was sidelined. And I think he learned the first of a series of important lessons about the nature hey. of the realm of power. You can't be part-time. In the 1968 campaign, it was said that he was advising Humphrey and also advising Nixon. Now, I've heard of people advising many different candidates in the same party, but rarely do people advise <laughs> candidates of different parties. Is that true, that he was doing both? It's not really true. He was advising Nelson Rockefeller, um, but periodically people would come to him. He was a foreign policy expert. He'd been in Vietnam right. several times, uh, and they would come and pick his brains, and Kissinger's attitude was, um, you know, if you ask me a question, I'll give you an answer. So it wasn't 
quite okay. that he was advising right. them. He right, was so being he was, art consulted by them. Right. He was close to Nelson Rockefeller. Then Nixon offers him, or more or less offers him the job. He was supposed to offer him. He didn't quite offer him the job of being national security advisor. Yeah. So he gets the job offer, but he says, I have to clear this with Nelson Rockefeller because right. I'm close to him. Yeah. He goes to Nelson Rockefeller and says, I have this offer to be national security <laughs> advisor, but I won't do it if this would upset you. Did he ever think that Nelson Rockefeller was going to say, no, you don't do it? And what would he have done if Nelson Rockefeller said, no, you can't take that job? Well, I don't think that was quite the thought process. What The problem was that Kissinger expected Rockefeller to be offered defense and that he then would go and work at the Pentagon with, with Rockefeller. Whereas Nixon's aversion to Rockefeller was so, so bitter that he had absolutely no intention of right. offering him even the job of janitor. Uh, Kissinger was so expecting that to be the plan that when, in his very oblique way, Nixon asked him to be national security advisor, he didn't even realize he was being offered the job. Right. So there was a good deal of confusion. And I think when Kissinger went to, to report to Rockefeller that he'd been given this offer, it was slightly in an embarrassed way because he was, he was right. also telling Rockefeller that he wasn't gonna get a job at all. But I don't think, Knowing, he, known, he knew Rockefeller really well. He'd, been, he'd advised Rockefeller through three different campaigns, each unsuccessful, to try to become the Republican nominee and the President of the United States. So I think he understood that Rockefeller wasn't going to stand in his way. Why would he have taken, why would Nixon have taken somebody who was Nelson Rockefeller's advisor, Harvard professor, and Jewish, yeah. and given him this important job? What was the thinking? It's a, it's a great question, and in volume one, I tried to come up with the answer. There's a funny answer, and since we promised we'd be funny, uh, Guido Goldman, who uh, was one of Kissinger's students at Harvard, had the explanation that Henry Kissinger was the only thing of Nelson Rockefeller's that Richard Nixon could afford. <laughs> that I quite like as an explanation, but it's not the right explanation. They had only met once before, so Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon had met once before uh, Nixon offered him the job, which is remarkable when you come to think of it. And it had been at a cocktail party in New York, and uh, Nixon, who was not noted for his social grace, had asked the one question that you love to be asked if you were a professor, especially a Harvard professor. Uh, uh, or rather, he didn't even ask him a question. He simply said, I've read one of your books, Music to the Ears of the Vain Intellectual. So they had a kind of brief conversation, um, and that was the last Kissinger right. heard of it. I assumed when I went through the records, I would find previous meetings, earlier encounters, that the relationship had to go back further. It turned out that every time Nixon had reached out to Kissinger before that point, Kissinger had dodged the meeting feeling that he didn't want to be involved with Nixon, that he wanted to be loyal to Rockefeller. So they'd never met other than that one time. So the only explanation that makes any sense is actually an intellectual one, that Nixon, who had a national security guide during the election campaign, was deeply impressed with, with Kissinger's work. And they'd come to at least the same conclusion, albeit from different directions, the, the key to foreign policy in the post-68 period would be to exploit the Sino-Soviet split. And they had both arrived at this idea from very se separate directions. But I think it was pure intellectual kinship. They, this was a very cerebral relationship. They were not friends, but as strategic thinkers, they were uncommonly well matched. So the ultimate answer to the question is that, that Nixon, who was quite antisocial, picked Kissinger for his mind. Okay, so 